Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webcast, Getting to the Heart of Comorbidities. My name is Jennifer Nguyen, and I will be your moderator for tonight's presentation. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer's speaker system by default. This means if you can hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select Use Telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address as many as possible at the end. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to take a moment to tell those of you who may be new to the foundation about who we are our mission, and what we do. The National Psoriasis Foundation is the world's largest nonprofit patient advocacy organization dedicated to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and we serve as the voice for millions of Americans who are affected by these diseases. Our mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. In order to move our mission forward, we engage thousands of volunteers around the country in activities that will lead to a cure. For more information about these opportunities, log on to our website after today's program at www.psoriasis.org. Finally, I would like to thank our sponsor, Celgene and Novartis, for making tonight's presentation possible. Now, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nahal Mehta from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute section of Inflammation and Cardiometabolic Diseases. Dr. Mehta earned his medical degree in an accelerated seven-year biomedical program at the George Washington University. He completed his internship, residency, and his chief medical residency in internal medicine at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He also completed his fellowships in cardiovascular diseases, nuclear cardiology, and preventive cardiology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. He then continued his postdoctoral training in genetic epidemiology with a focus on inflammation and lipoproteins at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Clinical Biostatistics and Epidemiology and the Institute of Translational Medicine and Therapeutics. In 2009, he earned a Master's of Science degree in Clinical Epidemiology and from Penn and became Director of Inflammatory Risk and Preventive Cardiology there as well. In 2012, Dr. Mehta was named the inaugural NIH Lasker Clinical Research Scholar, a unique honor from which he received a 15-year grant from the NIH to join the research program on the NIH campus. Dr. Mehta has received honors and awards from the American College of Physicians, the American Heart Association, and the American College of Cardiology, and is actively involved in the National Psoriasis Foundation Medical Board. Welcome, Dr. Mehta. Jennifer, thank you. Welcome, everybody, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to talk about today comorbid diseases getting to the heart of the matter. So today what we're going to try to talk about in the next 40 minutes or so, I'd like to leave a little bit of time for questions, is we're going to go over an overview of psoriasis severity and pathology, and we're going to move into how systemic inflammation that is seen in psoriasis takes a toll on the entire body beyond the skin. We're going to talk briefly, uh, but mention several conditions that have been demonstrated to be associated with psoriasis. And then finally, we're going to end on a very positive note about how to live a healthy lifestyle and talk to your provider about comorbidities. Next. So <clears throat> what is psoriasis? It's a chronic inflammatory skin disease that appears as thick plaques on the skin. 
there's a complex genetic basis of, uh, of, of uh, the immune system with environmental triggers. And building evidence has shown that these immune system malfunctions yield in, uh, these skin cells causing plaques on the body. It is not contagious. Next. In terms of the types of psoriasis, we're going to talk mostly about uh, plaque psoriasis that is pictured there in those three pictures. And it's patches of raised sick out, uh, skin cells covered by flaky white buildup called a scale. It is the most common form. Next. In terms of other forms of psoriasis, there is the gutate varieties shown there, uh, usually spots on the skin, pustular, which are white pustules, inverse, which are usually found in the skin folds, and erythrodermic psoriasis, which is uh, very large red areas of skin, often accompanied by severe pain and itching. Next. So in terms of psoriasis severity, there's really the easiest way to look at it is looking at the palm of your hand and uh, coalescing all of the plaques that are approximately on the body. And if they are less than 3% or 3 palms, the psoriasis is considered mild. If it's 3 to 10 palms or 3 to 10% of the body surface area, it's considered moderate. And severe is considered any of all of the following. So if you have severe skin disease of over 10%, if you have psoriatic arthritis, if you have vulnerable areas of involvement, including the genitals, the, the, the um, face and the hands, and overall if it impacts the quality of life in a way that uh, activities of daily living aren't performable. Next. So we're going to talk briefly. The, the, the purpose of these next few slides is to get us all on the same page about causes of psoriasis. There have been several genetic risk factors um, found um, in psoriasis where they cluster in families. And basically, an area on a gene uh, called a locus is a place where there may be variation of a base pair. Um, and these genes have been shown to predispose to certain types of psoriasis. Next. In addition, there are definitely possible triggers, and one should know the triggers for their own psoriasis, and certain ones uh, more commonly include medications, illnesses such as strep throat. Stress is a big one. We'll talk about that when we get to the, uh, um, uh, the, the psychological comorbidities associated with psoriasis. Diet and weather, as well as injuries to the skin, so scratches can do it as well. Next. In terms of the immunology, psoriasis is recognized as an immune-mediated disease, which means that there are immune cells in the body which are normally there to traffic um, pathogens or things that enter the body, such as bacteria and viruses. But there is definitive information that the immune system um, is probably seeing parts of the body as foreign in psoriasis. And so for that reason, it has been called an autoimmune disease. Next. The key component that we're going to be discussing later in the um, uh, webinar is going to be inflammation. And so inflammation, before thinking about it as being something that is a problem for the body, usually it's something that is to help the body heal. So what happens is, is inflammation is one way that the immune system fights pathogens or invaders. But when this inflammation does not turn off, or whether there's ongoing stimulus to keep your immune cells going, that is called inflammation. Next. So what we're going to talk about over the next several slides um, is the fact that psoriasis is more than what you see in, on the skin. Um, there are many diseases that result from these shared genetic associations. And since the immune system really does have contact with everything in the body, systemic inflammation has many impacts uh, beyond the skin in the body itself. Next. So I'm going to take a few minutes to just go through this slide a little carefully. And the reason is, is that this is going to lay the groundwork uh, for the next 20 minutes or so where we're going to talk about some of the comorbid or diseases that occur with psoriasis. Uh, so we're going to start from the top and work our way down. Um, and the burden of psoriatic disease, and this has been, uh, you know, uh, well studied now in, in, in several thousands of individuals demonstrating that there is uh, more anxiety, more depression, more thoughts of hurting oneself as well as alcoholism um, in a patient with severe psoriasis. 
In addition, there have been problems with the eyes reported, such as ocular inflammation, is iritis, ir uveitis, and episcleritis. Um, if we work our way down, you'll see something called metabolic syndrome, and what I would suggest that be called is cardiometabolic diseases. And those are what we are going to spend a considerable amount of time on later in the talk because these are in fact the most common comorbidities or the most common diseases that co-localize or, or associate with psoriasis. So what are they? High blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular risk factors that are elevated. And so those cluster together and call, and call the metabolic syndrome. In addition, you see that there's uh, some involvement of the gut or the stomach or the intestines there in the forms of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. About 2 to 3 percent of patients with psoriasis experience uh, these uh, inflammatory bowel symptoms. Uh, furthermore, you'll see that there is this cluster there on the left of psoriatic arthritis and spondyloarthropathies. So the elbow can be affected, the hands and the feet can be affected, the knees are most commonly affected. And finally, the nails are affected in a form of nail psoriasis commonly seen with psoriatic arthritis. And then finally, plaque psoriasis of other forms can affect any parts of the body, um, which are higher in those with plaque psoriasis. So there are frequent occurrences of palmoplantar uh, psoriasis along with plaque psoriasis. Next. So we're going to go through some of these, and I think the one to start with here is psoriatic arthritis. And one of the main reasons why is that it is an irreversible process once it is diagnosed and sort of uh, gets going. So what you want to do is really understand that about a third of patients with psoriasis will develop psoriatic arthritis during the course of the disease. Uh, one of the things that is important to understand is that a lot of the cytokines or inflammatory proteins that you see on this slide um, are in fact related to joint damage, but they're also in fact related to heart disease. So patients with psoriatic arthritis, in addition to having this increased uh, quality of life uh, disturbance with their arthritis, also have a higher risk of having blood vessel disease as well. Next. So psoriatic arthritis, what is it? Uh, we'll start with what the symptoms are. And what symptoms are is usually what patients experience. And signs are what doctors will find on patients. So symptoms of psoriatic arthritis include stiffness, pain, throbbing, swollen tender joints, swollen fingers or toes. If anyone's ever had a single swollen digit for a period of time that they didn't know why um, it looked swollen and it was hot, most likely it had to do with the fact that that may have been a psoriatic arthritis uh, flare-up. Nail changes are common. Fatigue is by far one of the most common uh, uh, pre, uh, factors that makes people aware that they may have uh, you know something beyond the burden of skin inflammation as well and the fact of morning stiffness with reduced range of motion is another common presenting factor and what is morning stiffness so most of us have trouble getting out of bed in the morning but morning stiffness is a prolonged stiffness in the morning lasting longer than 30 to 45 minutes to actually get going and shown here on the left are common areas where psoriatic affects the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the lower back are called the sacroiliitis, feet joints, the knee joint, as well as the hand joints, and the hand joints in particular are the, uh, the DIPs or the distal interphalangeal joints. The neck is also involved. And if you've ever wondered what these two things are, if you've ever seen them on yourself, this is an area where a, a, a tendon that's inserting into a bone is swollen. This is frequently mistaken up front as uh, just a uh, um, some sort of a fasciitis or something like that, but this is enthesitis, um, swollen tender area of the joint. And here you see that there is a swollen digit in two of the toes. In fact, some of them may uh, look like sausages, hence the term sausage digit. Next. So what do we see? on signs when patients come in with psoriatic arthritis. So first of all, like I said, timely diagnosis is crucial. A delay of more than six months can result in joint damage, erosions, creation of bone, destruction of bone, and worsening lifestyle, or life quality, I should say. Next. 
The second thing that we're going to cover this evening is going to be cardiovascular comorbidity. Uh, by far and away, cardiovascular comorbidities comprise uh, the largest single reason for uh, impairment of psoriatic life, whether it's by morbidity or by mortality. Um, one of the things that are pointed out on this slide is that people with severe psoriasis are 58% more likely to have one of these major cardiac events, which is a heart attack, a stroke, uh, or having some sort of a stent placed in their heart. And furthermore, 43% are more li uh, likely to have a stroke. And this is compared to those who do not have psoriasis but also have the same age and gender as those um, in the study. Next. So let's get on the same page. What is cardiovascular disease? So it's a class of disease that involves the heart or the blood vessels. It's also called heart disease. Could be clinical if you have signs and symptoms. You have chest pain or shortness of breath. It could be subclinical where you don't know you have it, but you happen to find it just looking um, during some other testing. Um, what's very important is patients with severe psoriasis are one and a half times more likely to have heart disease compared to those with mild or moderate psoriasis. So one of the messages is, is that if you do have uh, what we would consider to be severe psoriatic diseases, then one would be uh, a little bit more inclined also to screen aggressively for cardiovascular risk factors. Next slide. So types of cardiovascular disease, angina is a fancy word for chest pain. Heart attack is basically uh, myocardial infarction. Stroke is uh, either one where there's not enough blood to the brain or there's bleeding in the brain. And other forms are hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. Heart failure where the heart muscle itself gets weak. Arrhythmia, which is where the heart has short circuits and skips a beat. In fact, atrial fibrillation has recently been shown to be increased in patients with psoriasis. And heart valve problems such as aortic stenosis, which has also been increasing in patients with psoriasis. Next, pair. Next slide. So what are the risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease? One of them and the most common is high blood pressure, uh, which is common in psoriasis uh, by about uh, one out of every three psoriasis patients will have a diagnosis of high blood pressure during the course of their life after the age of 50. Diabetes, smoking, high cholesterol, having somebody in the family who's had a heart attack, mom, dad, sister, brother, doesn't count if it was an aunt, um, that was not related. Uh, obesity, somebody who has a body mass index of greater than 30, we'll talk about that. And then, of course, inflammation is now being recognized as a key driver uh, of atherosclerosis. Next slide. So going through why cardiovascular comorbid disease may be increased uh, in psoriasis really comes down to um, what are the things we've seen. So we've seen that the vessels, the blood vessels themselves are stiffer. We've seen that there's white blood cell associated high blood pressure. We've seen that through atherosclerosis that we've seen that there's accumulation and plaque formation within the blood vessels themselves. We've seen higher incidence of clot, which is called thrombosis, and thrombosis itself will alter um, how quickly one clots. Uh, finally, there are metabolic and hepatic cardiovascular manifestations, which are increasing insulin resistance, uh, as well as increased atherosclerosis. And so what I think is very important for people to understand here is that cardiovascular diseases take on many forms, and each of these are independently uh, linked to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the skin cells and, and the immune cells that are uh, observed in psoriasis. Next slide. So we're going to move on to diabetes, and I get a lot of questions about diabetes and why um, certain times um, we see our psoriatic patients come in with fasting sugars that are on the high side, and then over a course of five to seven years, they're diagnosed with frank diabetes. Well, I'm going to go through some of the data or the evidence of what's been going on, and I'd like to make this a frank discussion point at our Q&A session, that patients with severe psoriasis have about a 30% um, elevation for developing diabetes, and people with mild psoriasis have about a 17% uh, greater risk for developing diabetes. Next. 
So what is diabetes? It's changes in blood sugar uh, that you need to take medications. Um, there are things that happen when you have diabetes and psoriasis, and it could actually worsen the psoriasis symptoms when you have diabetes. Skin manifestations of diabetes resemble those that of psoriasis. Uh, finger sticks and other uh, triggers can make the psoriasis worse, so if you're injecting insulin. Um, and one should be aware that uh, the insulin and other medications that are used to treat diabetes, such as sulfonylureas, um, they may make the skin more sensitive to ultraviolet light, something very important to keep in mind. Next slide. Emerging evidence, this is very important that we uh, also introduce the concept of the fact that patients who have psoriasis may have an increased predilection to where it's having diagnosed depression. And the slide here says 25%. I would actually posit that it might be a little bit higher uh, in certain parts of the world during certain parts of the um, seasons, especially higher in the winter and the dark months. Um, furthermore, what's not covered on the slide is there's a recent study that demonstrated that there was more anxious depression uh, observed in psoriasis, so those who have more anxiety um, along with the depression. And I think one of the things that are important to also mention is, is that there have been two studies recently shown that when a patient has depression in psoriasis, they have a greater risk for developing future heart disease and future diabetes. Um, so I think depression is uh, one of the more important comorbidities that has gained some recognition um, uh, in, the, in the recent few years uh, within psoriasis. Next slide. We talked about the metabolic syndrome. I like to call it cardiometabolic diseases. Uh, it really uh, boils down to having a cluster of abnormalities that tend to be related due to some sort of inflammatory obese state. Obesity is defined as a waist size greater than 35 inches for women or 40 inches for men. Most commonly, we take a height and a weight and we calculate a body mass index. All too frequently, as a cardiologist who specializes in psoriatic diseases, I'm the first one telling um, patients who come to see me that they are obese. Uh, that is not something that I'm proud of, but I think it's important that um, everybody is on the same page uh, of their, for their body mass index. If those on the webinar do not know their body mass index, there's a calculator that Google has from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute where you can type in your height and your weight and it will give you your body mass index and you're aiming for that number to be less than 30. Um, abnormal cholesterol levels, either elevated uh, triglycerides, which is a short-term fat that you uh, measure in the blood, or low levels of the good cholesterol called HDL, both of those are very frequently observed in the metabolic syndrome, which is also frequently observed in psoriasis. High blood pressure we discussed is uh, one of the more uh, emerging important risk factors that can be treated and detected early in psoriasis. And there is diabetes and insulin resistance, which we have talked about as well. I think what is extremely important in looking at this field over the last 10 years or so, when I joined in 2006, really trying to understand the link between uh, heart disease and obesity. Um, and when I stumbled upon psoriasis as uh, you know, one of these factors that we actually can do something about um, to mitigate these risks, at that time, the metabolic syndrome was considered prediabetes, and it still is. And how I look at psoriasis is I look at it as a pre-metabolic syndrome. So it's actually a pre-pre-diabetes. So we want to keep this in mind that if there are metabolic abnormalities developing in a patient, we want to remind them that frank diabetes is going to ensue quicker in a patient with psoriasis because of all of these clusters. Next slide. We talked about uh, the gut or the, the GI tract. People with psoriatic diseases and Crohn's have similar genetic uh, variations. And symptoms of Crohn's disease include diarrhea, abdominal pain, and bloody stools. There's also a variety of inflammatory bowel disease called ulcerative colitis. Um, that is limited to just the colon, not the whole GI tract. But both of these have been increased in psoriasis by approximately 2 to 3%. Um, it is very important to remember that we're also learning that there is a subclinical colitis in the psoriatic patient, um, often unrecognized, um, also with the amount of depression and anxiety that has been uh, uh, noted to be uh, um, 
observed in psoriasis, there's also this um, uh, increase in, in irritable bowel syndrome, which is an important distinction from inflammatory bowel disease because the treatments are completely different. Next. I think cancer comes up more frequently when somebody has something that they've been diagnosed with and then they look back and say, ah, I have psoriasis, is it related? But the slide here does uh, take a stance saying that inflammation may increase the risk of cancer with psoriatic diseases. And it is because inflammation may promote cancer growth, but I would, I would actually suggest that one of the things that are more increased in psoriasis are bloodborne cancers such as lymphoma and leukemia. And the lymphoma that is seen in psoriasis may in fact be due to this overactive immune system. Furthermore, solid tumors are also increased and not to forget that skin cancers themselves such as basal cell carcinomas are also increased um, in patients with psoriasis. Next slide. I would say approximately one in 10 people um, or approximately seven to 10 percent of people and pa uh, patients with psoriatic arthritis will develop a uveitis and you'll see that this person here um, their left eye is sparing the rim here but there is a tremendous amount of inflammation throughout the uvea which includes these three structures here and the choroid really uh, does get inflamed and, um, and, and turn uh, uh, this, this area very irritably uh, uh, itchy as well as uh, affected uh, unless treatment is sought. Next slide. Uh, liver disease. Patients with psoriasis may be at greater risk for developing a liver condition called fatty liver. And I think that the warning signs here are very, very late stage in this where you see yellowing and swelling and mental confusion and nausea. In fact, what I would say about liver diseases is that as we're learning more about the psoriatic uh, uh, inflammatory patterns, that the liver is basically a sieve for the body. It, it collects everything for the body. And one of the things that the liver may be is overactive uh, because of uh, always filtering out a lot of overactive blood cells. And so one must keep in mind that as we're looking at agents that may be liver toxic, such as statin medicines or methotrexate, one must keep in mind that if there is subclinical liver disease, that that may be brought about by using certain medications and one must keep that in mind as they're going through this. I don't avoid those medicines um, in patients with psoriasis, I just use them with caution. Next slide. So I think this is the fun part of the talk. I think that you know we're going to wrap up uh, with really, uh, I don't want this to be a look at all of the things that we've shown you associate with psoriasis. This is, hey, let's open everyone's eyes and show that emerging evidence supports that these may be found in patients with psoriasis. But I would say the first message that I would say about what you can do, ignoring these things on the slide, the first thing I would say is remembering what we were told while we were growing up as children, right? Stay active, eat healthy, do things in moderation that are not supposed to be very good for you, or try to avoid them completely. The slide here points out a few things. One of the biggest ones, which is treat appropriately to the level of your disease. My most frequent question that I get is, Dr. Mehta, do we know whether treating psoriasis will mitigate my risks of these diseases? Well, there's never been a randomized trial testing these interventions, so we don't know. Anecdotally, there's enough observational evidence that treating the disease will mitigate these uh, uh, comorbid diseases but we just don't know at this point. Number two, the longer a patient has psoriasis, the greater the risk of developing comorbidities. That has been shown um, in multiple studies that duration has an important impact on comorbid disease development in psoriasis. The next bullet is important that the more severe, the greater the risk. And we say that the, you know, patients with severe psoriasis are one and a half times more likely to have heart disease than those with mild or moderate psoriasis. 
I would also say that the more severe psoriasis has a more inflammatory burden, so it can develop more psoriatic arthritis, um, it can develop more problems with quality of life. Um, and the final thing I say, and you know, I, I started talking to the foundation about this years back, that you know, we, we started with the concept of beyond skin uh, or more than skin deep. And now I've started to really believe, especially with the studies that we've been performing um, at the NIH, that it may be that even one plaque is too much. Um, and that's something that I've been saying now for about a year, that even patients with mild disease have an increased risk of comorbidities. If someone told me that having mild disease was going to impact my ability to uh, avoid a heart attack by a certain percent, well, I would want to know that. Patients with mild psoriasis have a 10% increase in a heart attack, a 15% increase in incident diabetes, and about a 30% increase in obesity. These are people with elbows and knees variants of psoriasis. So again, I go back and say before treating that disease or those plaques, really try to um, get active. And if you can't get active, really try to you know, lead a healthy lifestyle, avoid smoking, avoid excessive alcohol, um, avoid late night binge eating. Um, I think those are the biggest messages here that I've been um, able to you know, whittle down to what you really know you can do. Next slide. And that's whittled down right here, which is, you know, eating healthy, you can go to the uh, Google machine and type in American Heart Association uh, step one or step two diet. One is basically preventing a heart attack. Step two diet is once you've had a heart attack, what you should eat. So either the AHA step one or step two diet. I would also say eat small frequent meals, avoid large, large uh, late meals. I would say engage in gentle activity. In fact, exercise doesn't even have to be the word. You can grab uh, you know, a, a friend and go walk around the mall for a mile. If you can't walk, go get into a pool. If you don't have access to a pool, sit in a chair at home and just do some bicycles. Make sure that you're really trying to get your blood moving at least 20 minutes a day, five days a week. I would say talking to your healthcare provider about comorbidities would be a very proactive way of handling this. Um, we've been trying to reach providers now for a few years saying you should at least let your patients know about this, but it would be nice for a patient to come up and say something about this. And screen for psoriatic arthritis every six months. We have a PSA screen available on the foundation's website. Next slide. So I have received a whole host of questions from the foundation, but what I would recommend is making some of the Q&A session more interactive. And if we start seeing some themes, I can start bringing up uh, what we would say are uh, things that we want to tackle. But with that, I'd like to conclude by just reminding you that if you've tuned in tonight, it really uh, demonstrates that you're trying to take the next step forward in educating yourself, your patients, whether you're a patient yourself or you're a provider. Um, and one of the main messages that I think is important to, to share among this uh, audience is that education is the answer, is letting people know that they have risks for these diseases. That's more than any um, research is going to uh, impact life in the short term. Now in the long term, we are hopeful we understand these comorbid diseases better. As most of you know, I am a preventive cardiologist, so I have a particular interest in blood vessel disease and metabolic diseases, but I'm happy to take questions related to anything that I've covered this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta. Um, as you said, now we'll move into the Q&A portion of the webcast. Uh, the first question here is, what are the early signs of heart disease? So heart disease itself is asymptomatic. Um, if you uh, were looking a little bit later, uh, there's no symptoms until there's been some accumulation, but the most common signs of heart disease, of early heart disease, um, and when we say early, that means that there is already a problem with narrowing of the heart arteries which are causing symptoms, but some of the earliest symptoms are chest pain, shortness of breath, and for women over the age of 50, slowing down just becoming tired. Um, there's a, a wealth of evidence that atypical symptoms in women need to be worked up for heart disease. 
Um, so really it comes down to chest pain, shortness of breath, or being limited um, by these things. A very easy screen that I tell patients is if you have stairs in the house and you're able to climb up those stairs with uh, bags of groceries in your hand and you get to the top of those 11 or 12 stairs and if you are not out of breath or not having chest pain, you probably do not have uh, heart disease that is critical at that moment in time. Great, thank you, Dr. Mehta. Next question, does taking NSAIDs cause high blood pressure and what medicines can be taken for high blood pressure? So NSAIDs through the kidney uh, mechanism can absolutely cause high blood pressure. Um, it's not as common as uh, uh, one would think where widespread NSAID use has not re resulted in um, uh, you know, an over uh, abundance of high blood pressure, but one thing we do know of is, is that NSAID use has a few uh, deleterious effects. One of them is on the kidneys, one of them is on the actual blood pressure itself, and we have to be mindful of those. In terms of medications for blood pressure, I would not worry about some of the earlier reports of certain high blood pressure medicines um, causing um, psoriasis to get worse. There have been some reports that beta blockers should be avoided. I haven't had any problems with them. Um, I've also gotten some reports that um, ACE inhibitors uh, may worsen psoriasis. I have never had a problem with that either. Great, thank you. Next question, um, does the use of TNF-alpha treatments for psoriasis increase uh, the probability of developing comorbidities? No, it's in fact, we would think the opposite if the hypothesis is true that we are testing that inflammation in the body is driving this. Um, Anti-TNF therapies reduce inflammation. Now they do associate with a touch of weight gain and associate with a little bit of increase in your cholesterol, but I don't have evidence to support this statement. I just would suspect that use of uh, a systemic agent by reducing systemic inflammation would be beneficial to um, the milieu, the body itself. Um, I would say that the one worry that people have with these um, these anti-TNFs is the risk of um, cancers or solid tumors. What I would say to that is we are now at a point where we're at 10 to 12 years of having solid registry data um, and these registries have not shown that there's a, a, a tremendous increase in lymphoma or malignancy um, in uh, these patients. So I would say the opposite. In fact, the question I would say is do anti-TNFs actually ameliorate or improve um, comorbid diseases? And my, my guess there would be yes, but again, I'm not sure. Great, thank you. Next question, is there a way to check for systemic inflammation or um, a way to diagnose internal inflammation through imaging or other testing? Well, that's a tough question. Um, I don't recommend that people go and start asking for inflammatory or inflammation um, testing unless there's something that they're trying to understand. Most of this inflammation and psoriasis can be um, ascertained by looking at the patient. Do they have a lot of thick, red, active, beefy plaques? Um, a lot of the inflammation that the person who is asking the question might be getting at can be measured by way of uh, a, an HS or a high sensitivity CRP um, to measure how inflamed the body is. But my uh, issue with that is, is that CRP is not very ac accurate in uh, chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, other tests that are available, you could uh, check a sedimentation rate. It's called an ESR test, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. That also will be a crude measure of how inflamed the body is. But again, I think that we use the term inflammation very loosely at times, saying that, oh, well, we want to measure the exact amount of inflammation. I would challenge that person to think about, rather than trying to measure that inflammation in the blood, looking at how much inflammation there is on the skin by the severity of their psoriasis. 
Great, thank you. Um, next question. You had mentioned um, eating healthy as part of um, a lifestyle choice. Can you speak about um, dietary changes to address inflammation? That's a tough one. Yeah, okay. So I would say the first part of that is if you are looking for diet changes, that's an easy fix. That's basically the biggest things that I think make our psoriatic patients more unhealthy and at risk is um, eating high carbohydrate foods. So I would say reducing the amount of carbohydrates that one takes in, um, increasing the amount of, of lean proteins um, that one takes in. I get a lot of questions about uh, diets that may reduce inflammation. There's really no good data out there on what diets those should be. Um, the South Beach diet is probably the closest that we can say is scientifically valid because it's a diet of moderation. Um, I would also say that the Mediterranean diet is one that we could strive for to increase our omega-3 fatty acids. Um, fish oil, if you can tolerate it, is always a very good um, medication if you have low HDL and you want to increase your HDL. But I would also um, say that if you're going that direction, just eat more fish um, because really the best parts of uh, the, 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 the diet there is the fact that it's coming directly from the source. Um, I don't have good evidence. Things that I do ask people to remember is that, um, you know, avoid the things that you know make you feel lousy. So if you know having several beers makes you feel lousy, or having large hamburgers makes you feel lousy, or eating a lot of gluten-containing food makes you feel lousy, will then avoid those things, but we don't have blanket statements we can make. We do know that limiting alcohol intake does help. We do know that limiting sa um, saturated fats in the forms of red meat and cheeses and creams helps, um, but that's about it. We don't know of any diets per se that reduce inflammation. Um, you know, I get at least a call a week or a call every other week about oh, I've got this great new diet, is it impacting my inflammation? I think it is. If it's making you feel good, that's great. But I don't think we have a, a sense of what does or does not reduce inflammation. Great, thank you. Next question, does psoriasis have an effect on bone density or any connection with osteoporosis? That's a good question. Not that I've heard. I, I mean, we could we could probably interrogate the literature and, and see, but it's not one that comes to mind. Now, I can postulate that there would be more osteoporosis and bone development diseases in psoriasis because of vitamin D deficiency, um, but that's going to be a different axis. So if we're talking about whether it leads to osteoporosis, I'm not sure. Do we know whether or not um, psoriasis patients are vitamin D deficient? I think we do. Um, we do think that psoriasis patients tend to not get as much sun exposure. Um, we think that there may be um, some defect in activating vitamin D, although that's not been well borne out. Um, and vitamin D is a key cofactor for calcium handling. And so through that, we may say yes that there is an increased risk of osteoporosis, but it's never really been brought up, and I'd really love to um, look into that a little further. I think that's an excellent question. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, is there a connection between chronic kidney disease and psoriasis? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, epidemiologically, there's been a study um, not too long ago that um, did cover the fact that renal disease or chronic kidney disease after the age of 50 was higher in psoriasis compared to those without psoriasis. The authors went on to say that it may be a fibrosis mechanism, that maybe the kidney is getting early fibrosis, but the mechanisms have not been borne out. One of the other things that we need to keep in mind was that study was not able to look beyond um, standard um, risk factors for kidney disease, so we don't know if there's something unique about it, but if more psoriasis patients have high blood pressure, high blood pressure is the 
biggest risk factor for chronic kidney disease. So it may be operating in that fashion. Great, thank you. Next question, is there a difference among biologics for reducing inflammation of internal organs or reducing cardiovascular risk? Wow, okay, so there are, the most commonly prescribed uh, biologic is an anti-TNF, I think followed by, my facts have to be checked here, uh, but I think followed by IL-1223 or Stellara. So if we want to start using some names of drugs that people might recognize, I try not to use uh, trade names, but I will in this case. Um, Humira, uh, Embril, those are anti-TNFs. Stellara is an IL-1223. Um, and then there's these new kids on the block, the IL-17 inhibitors, Cosentix and Talx. And those also have a, a, a very good uh, profile up till now about uh, efficacy and safety. So are there differences between them? Well, if um, somebody had a billion dollars, I think we can do the trial to see how efficacious they are for reduction of comorbid disease. Um, but since we don't have that, I can tell you that they're pretty efficacious with treating psoriasis. There's been uh, good studies that show that Stellara is good for psoriatic arthritis. Humira also pretty good for psoriatic arthritis. Um, but that's about it. We are now completing studies looking at randomized trials of biologic therapy and their impact on vascular disease. But those results probably won't be um, available for about a year now. So we don't know what those are going to show. Uh, but do we think there's a differential effect? Again, I think it would be fascinating to learn that. We don't know it at this time. One of our trials is testing the um, uh, question whether having psoriasis treated with a biologic versus having psoriasis treated with ultraviolet light um, makes a difference. And how neat would it be if ultraviolet light actually had the same or similar impact as a biologic. What that would answer us as a question would be what? It would answer the question that it's treating the psoriatic disease, not the mechanism by which you're treating the psoriatic disease. But we just don't know at this point. Great, thank you. Um, one other question. Is there a connection between psoriatic disease and inflammation of the pancreas? Never been studied. That's a very good question, and could that be a link to the diabetes? Really, I, I don't think the answer is going to be a straightforward one, um, but I think we just don't know. I think it's a good, um, it's a good thing to test. I don't know how we would measure pancreatic inflammation, um, but I do think that it's a, it's, it's an unknown, it's an unknown answer at this point. Great, thank you, doctor. Um, one other question, is there um, a comorbid association between psoriatic arthritis and fibromyalgia? Not that we know of. Uh, in fact, fibromyalgia has trigger points and psoriatic arthritis does not. So I would think that there is no relationship. Great, thank you. Um, and one other uh, question, what what provider would you recommend um, a psoriatic patient see about monitoring for all of these possible comorbid mm. conditions? I think that's a great question to have towards the end of the seminar because people always tend to remember things at the end and from the beginning and they forget everything in between. Um, I think the most important thing that they can do, and uh, I will include a slide the next webinar that we have like this so that people can actually have this, and we should maybe put this on the, the website as we develop more data, but I really remind people to ask any provider. So it could be a minute clinic, it could be your local CVS urgent clinic, it could be your primary care provider, it could be your rheumatologist, but they may not want to uh, take on the, the diagnosis of these uh, cardiovascular risk factors. It could be a dermatologist, but there's a low likelihood that a dermatologist will have the equipment needed to do these things. They may. Um, but what do I say? So go find someone who you enjoy the company of. And if it is somebody at a minute clinic or an urgent care center, fine. Get three Bs. The first B, get your body mass index. So your height and your weight. You can probably do that right now if you have a scale at home 
and approximate your height without shoes. Do your body mass index, first B. Second B, blood pressure. Sit down for five minutes in a quiet room and check your blood pressure. Anybody can do that. In fact, you can do that tomorrow at a CVS or something like that. Number three, blood. So this is where you do need somebody to check your blood. What are you looking at your blood for? Cholesterol and glucose. Anybody can do that. You can actually go to a LabQuest or a LabCorp um, with a script from your primary care doctor that says check fasting sugar and fasting lipids and you'll have that information fairly quickly. Um, so what I would say is any provider can do it, have the three B's checked. You will see that there is a tremendous amount of undiagnosed high blood pressure, obesity, and high cholesterol. Great, thank you so much. And just one last question. Um, if you have psoriasis under control and well managed, will the comorbidities still exist? We don't know. Uh, most of the data that I have shared with you have shown that those patients who have severe disease and not treated have these um, untoward outcomes. We believe that there's probably some benefit to treating the disease and keeping it at bay, although we don't have the data to support that. I would say, yes, your comorbid risk goes down. Some people may say, no, it, it's not known. Um, but anecdotally, I would say that it's pretty well, uh, uh, I think it's pretty well accepted in the cardiology community that if you treat inflammation or if you reduce inflammation, you reduce your risk for clotting, you reduce your risk for um, having clot rupture or plaque rupture for MI. Um, so I think that's the best answer we could probably give. Great. Thank you so much, Doctor. And thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I think at this time we'll end our uh, webinar. If anyone has any other questions, please contact our Patient Navigation Center by phone, email, live chat, or Skype. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. Thank you again to our sponsors. And finally, I just wanted to mention that a recording of tonight's webcast will be available shortly on our website, and you can access our complete webcast archive by visiting www.psoriasis.org slash webcast. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehta, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Good night.